So my, so my, to me, the other issue is, you know, even, and this is where, if you will, AI, this is to me is where the real threat to, to humanity in AI lies. It's not so much that we're going to develop this, these super, super, super smart computers. Um, yeah, they're getting more sophisticated. It's that, again, because of the, because of the society and the economic system and political system that we have, you know, we're, we're developing this increasing, increasingly sophisticated technology that not because it's smarter or more conscious than humans are, but it just does repetitive things better than humans do. Um, and, and increasingly more sophisticated things were over time, we're replacing human, humans from the, from the economic system. In other words, humans increasingly have fill a smaller and smaller gap in this in the system that produces the goods and services. Well, in some level, you could say, well, that's so what? We've always done that. But the problem is we've become so economically centric in our society. And the form that it takes is the, you know, the, the money flows up. To me, the real danger is, and I've always framed it in this way, what would it what would happen if we had a sufficient technology that we could produce that that all 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 of the goods and services that could be possibly used by you know the eight billion people could be could be totally produced using only one billion people? What would happen to the other seven billion? You know, would the one billion that that actually does the production basically come around to say, well, shit, we don't need those other 7 billion people. Let's just get rid of them. That's the real danger. And it, you know, you don't have to have the computer or the, the computer systems developed to the point of being conscious or even being terribly sophisticated. It just has to be sophisticated enough to replace increasingly larger numbers of money. People, you know, I, I read some statistics somewhere that said that, and I can't remember if it was by 2050, but maybe it was by 2030, they were saying that 50% of the work that humans currently do are going to be done by, by technology. And I mean, what do you do when vast numbers of people on the planet <coughs> just don't produce anything, don't contribute anything to the production of goods and services. I mean, that's the kind of dystopia that, that Harari was painting in, in Homo Deus. I really like where this conversation is going and we just started recording. So, we are we are just kind of taking a step back just for the recording people who are watching and just saying like what have we learned what are, what are our new thoughts on this ai issue since last time so this is really really wonderful stuff so thanks paul steve yeah i just i also wanted to pick up on what a couple of people said and, and just yeah the possible polarities it's got to be two things it's not a more or less of right <clears throat> it's two things we'd want but they they both have pros and cons and then that's the management. So I, I, from what we've said so far, I think one of them could be productivity or, or you know, making life easier or more productive, more fruitful. Um, that, that which kind of goes back to your example about the, the, the sewing machine and, and the, the time to break from that. And that obviously has pros and cons in itself, but, it, but the theme there is, is productivity. And then maybe the other one is human flourishing. And then if you look at those, you know, from the from the lens of AI, so the AI coming coming on the productivity side, and then whether that can support or, uh, or you know, it, it, I guess on the next might, might inhibit um, human flourishing. But that that seems like two themes which are not it's not a more of or less of. They're both things that could coexist, um, but there are tensions between them. So you're saying that the the uh, diagram would have uh let's just check here let, let me let me share this so would it be human uh 
productivity over here and flourishing over here are, are just tough. So one would be like, one would be just productivity or like like gain you know productivity gains or whatever, um, uh -huh. which is uh, really how AI is mostly sold. And then uh -huh. um, the other side okay. is a human flourishing. Okay, so I'm going to do it this way: human flourishing. Okay. And then what about the top and the bottom? So, and, and what, can you remind me what that access is meant to, what that, what those, um, what, what that one's meant to be? Um, well, it's, it's, I'm trying to remember what he said. Do you remember, Bill? Greater purpose statement, right. deep, deeper fear from lack okay. of balance. Right. So then the top one would be something that encapsulates productivity and human flourishing going together, which I guess, mm. you know, that's, that's, that's been kind of the, the, the uh, It's of utopia, yes. It? Yeah, it's utopia. utopia. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. And then the down here. Suffering. And this is this? Mad Max. Yeah. EYS. <laughs> U utopia dystopia dys dys oh sorry thank you guys okay all right that's great all right steve did you want to add anything else by the way i'm capturing all of these new thoughts here but i'm not going to share the screen because i would rather see your, your faces but i'm capturing here this link is available for everyone okay so let's see did you want to add anything else steve um, no, no, I just want to say, I thought as a polarity that that kind of captured a lot of the themes that we we're discussing. I love it. Yeah, it's really good. Okay, let's go to Barbara. And again, I'm not going to share. I want to just see her faces and then we will pull it back up when we're ready. You know, I, uh, this wasn't what I was going to say, but Steve, to respond to productivity, uh, that is certainly a orange uh, world as it is term for it but mm -hmm. um when when i was a kid uh my grandmother actually had a um hand washing machine and and you had to uh take water out of the clothes by cranking it through a ringer yeah, uh, my grand so, had the same thing <laughs> so so it pr productivity would not have been in their vocabulary um it, it would have been to make life safer and easier mm -hmm. right um to uh and and you know maybe the productivity sense in for example i remember when when we went from canning to freezing and uh you know in in half a day you could freeze half the refrigerator it would take you weeks to can that much uh so, so in in that sense maybe but it, but it was always about making life easier for the family um you know, making it physically easier, a lot of it. Uh, and, and so now we've gone from making it physically easier to making it mentally easier. So uh, think about how many kids can't add two and two without their calculator. You know, uh, and, and I think all of us have found found that we do math less well in our heads be, because if it's really important, we punch it into the calculator, don't we? So productivity might not be the quite right term there. We need to think a little more about that as to what that enables. But what I was gonna say is this is not a polarity. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, Bill, uh, I know you've talked to, uh, uh, to John Barry as well. Right. Um, one one of the things that that he and I talked about years ago was uh, the po polarities are a simplification in in the in the real world. Everything's a multarity. So I've, I've got ease and um, and flourishing. Right. My my life is easy and and it's uh, it's it, you know there's no meaning in it. Right that sort of thing. But then I've also got uh, resources and uh, and proper use of those resources, for example. 
so so right now you know the growth at all costs and you, you know the amount of bling in in the um if i go into a walmart in a, um in an affluent area it actually will have a little bit of uh edible food in it it, it will have uh bigger food aisles than uh than it has um uh junk food aisles if, if i go into the one in uh the inner city it has bling at the door. I mean, just cheap crap, right? Uh, because people can't afford any kind of quality things to make their ho hovel, hovel, not house, but hovel pretty. Uh, it has um, aisles and aisles of junk food, right? And and then if you walk all the way through it, you actually find a, a few rotting fruits and vegetables and, and uh, some poor quality meat, right? So it, it so there's also this other polarity of, of resource use versus, versus ease of just getting anything you want. And, and they're, they're, they're not 100% orthogonal to each other, but they're definitely different ideas. So as we come across this, maybe we need to think about whether there are three or four polarities that we need to assign things to. I think that's really, I totally agree. I think we're getting closer to well, some of the kind of thoughts that were bubbling in my brain um, since we met last. Uh, so Josh just raised his hand. Paul, do you want to just let him go first because he didn't really yeah, get to And then we can go to Paul. You're home, Josh. Hi. Hello. Hello. Well, building on my other point about a polarity potentially between whether humans can control AI or out of control, maybe a polarity is taking the precautionary principle and having some very strong safeguards in place or kind of a letter rip free for all innovation where there are no stops to prevent the emergence of it. So that's me doing my best to not bring anything positive, negative. I think that's a real polarity. Some people are like, oh, hey, you technophobes need to get out of the way. We need to be able to do whatever we want with this or the bad guys will do it or whatever. And then other people are like, well, you know, maybe we can not just let everything that we can do happen in the world, which is something I think that comes up in science. It comes up with military and dabbling in stuff like that. So maybe that's a potential polarity to discuss. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. laissez-faire approach versus some kind of strong guidance and structure to innovation. Cool, thanks, Josh. Paul. My, what I'm gonna suggest may somewhat lead to how we structure the rest of the presentations here. Um, I think we're really starting to hit on the fact that AI does it impact so many aspects of human life. And each one of those creates a polarity. And, and not just a polarity in opposites on the on the horizontal, but polarities on the opposites of the, the vertical also. I mean, it just it it has so many impacts. And to, to illustrate it, I'll go back to uh, something that you'd said earlier, Beth, about the the making of their own clothes. You know, our grandparents made of their own clothes, but they had to take so much time. Now we had, um, now we make, we produce those clothes cheaply over in wherever, Singapore, Vietnam, what, you know, what, choose your country, um, in sweatshops. Well, it's more nuanced than that, you know, would, because it goes deeper than that. I mean, it's not just creating ease on the side of the consumer, you know, the, the American woman who doesn't have to sew, sew clothes versus a sweatshop. It's not just versus a sweatshop. It goes deeper than that. It goes, you know, would, it, would that be a bad situation if it wasn't a sweatshop? What if, if it was a healthy, um, well-paid you know, manufacturing facility that paid 
its employees well. So that's not a that's not a sweatshop issue. That's a how does the organization decide to run itself? How does the manufacturer run itself? Um, so it's you know well you could say well like they that that'll cost more. Well, no, not necessarily. What if what if that corporation decided we're just not going to have such a high return on our investment. We're just going to have a minimal return on investment. You know, it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. So it could be that we could we could try rather than going deeply into choosing, you know, the two polarities, you know, choose some and then go not so deeply into them, cap capture some of the things that come out of that and then maybe move on to another one. I mean, go back, go back to the one that you've got up there now. That I actually started making a list of the polarities that I've heard so far. And um, okay. yeah, okay. so this one is the human human flourishing yeah. productivity. Okay. Yeah, okay. So let's keep those, keep the 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 horizontal ones there, but in, instead of utopia and dystopia, put large organizations and on the bottom put small organizations hmm. i mean okay. that and that captures one very very strong element in that i mean who gains by technology mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. out of the gate it's the large organizations but Bill, wouldn't that imply that small organizations are the bad? Yeah, I, I would think so. It reminds me of a book <laughs> so we read I'd in college. Be, yeah. okay, small is beautiful. That's a good beautiful. point. That's a good small point. is beautiful. It was an environmental ethics class way long ago. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah, that's I a good ask, so We could do something other than a polarity, which which is this would be a second polarity between large and small organizations, right? Um, well, we we have the rest of our lives, ladies and gentlemen. So I wanna just list off the polarities that I've heard, okay? So we have this human flourishing and productivity, right? Or, or making life easy. That's another interesting, like it's productivity slash and I, I, Bill taught me you have to use the word and not but, right? Yeah, right, Bill. Uh, and then we have humans doing physical labor and less dangerous work, right? It's like the mom sewing the, the clothes and poking herself with a needle and the machine doing it in a country far away. Uh, so... Yeah, anyways, humans doing well-paid jobs. I heard this one from, I think it was Paul, and reducing the cost of goods, right? Those are two polarities. Uh, and by the way, if I'm saying any of these things or if we wanna make them better, go ahead and jump in. Uh, resource use, this was one of the first ones that Barbara came up with. Resource use in the Walmart example versus, or and, and ease of you, ease of getting anything you want. And again, I'm I'm just using the words that were said, but we can iterate on them. And then Josh's precautionary principle and a laissez-faire approach to innovation. Is it so, is it laissez-faire, Josh? There there's something that I in 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 uh, in the capitalist rhetoric that that's what it would be called, but I'm not sure that's the 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 right term. Uh, I might call it uh, wild it west, term. wild west gunslinger approach. <laughs> yeah, I didn't right? use that it's term, but I think fair uh, means you don't intervene. But it, but it's it it feels like it's beyond that. Uh, uh, Josh, uh, what what are you feeling into that? Yeah, I didn't use that term specifically. I think Beth put that in there, but I do think I think they're kind of equivalent. It doesn't matter to me. Mm. I was just thinking about. I think, I think with the priorities, they're not meant to be opposite to each other. Are they? They're meant to be things that you could potentially want both of. Right. Um, 
and then they both have a they, both sides of polarity have a negative and positive expression, uh, which is where you then get the four. Ah, quadrants, so right? yeah, so so mm. uh, laissez-faire might be okay in the neutral term then, mm. and okay. then the negative is is uh, the the wild west gunslingers are taking over the universe, and yeah, and the positive of, of that is. Uh, Unleashing creativity or whatever, yeah. Yeah, well, our Nikola Tesla uh, is allowed to have clever ideas, right? As mm -hmm. bizarre as they are. Okay. I, I have another polarity here. Put put it below the humans doing well, paid jobs versus reducing the cost of goods. Because this this again points out another way of humans doing well paid jobs. versus corporations and, and and corporations accepting reasonable profits a reason that's that word reasonable has lots of wiggle room but but that's to me humans doing well paid jobs being opposed against reducing cost of goods um I mean, you can't do that. You, if you pay the humans well and they they are part of the process, the cost of goods will go up. The problem isn't the cost of goods. The it's not a it's not a middle. It's not a it's not an expense issue. It's not an ex, it's not an exchanging expense for expense. It's it's an expense versus bottom line issue. Yeah, I I think no, no, I'm I'm going to uh, say from from the. Uh, from the productivity world, uh, people would disagree with you. That they, they would say yeah. that uh, that that there's two aspects there. There's there's the sweatshops, but there's also my my grandma's sewing machine, right? So so if I if I give grandma a sewing machine, then great grandma, sorry, then then um, she can produce the same amount of goods. Uh, with with less effort. So on a dollar per hour or what uh, on an output per hour, she she then is better off without uh, you know, yes, the cost of the sewing machine, but but once once that's paid off, you're you're better off. So I think it's you can reduce the cost of goods uh, with with innovation as well as as with starvation. I think we've gone toward the starvation back again these days, but but it's it's not a foregone conclusion. And, and the innovation <laughs> point is important in the context of AI because that's again how it's being sold. It's being sold as you know the initial industrial revolution on the whole made people richer, uh, and the uh, this is now being pitched as the latest kind of industrial revolution, if you like, information revolution, you know, industrial information revolution, which. And the, the sales pitch will be this will make people richer because we can all do more and have more with less effort, basically. But you, you're right, Steve. But the, again, the issue that's going on right now that's at the core of this is not doesn't have anything to do with AI. It doesn't have anything to do with productivity. It doesn't have anything to do with innovation. It has to do with the fact of who reaps the fruits of those innovations. And the model that exists in our world today is it's a capitalist system and i'm not and not and i'm not arguing against capitalism i don't want to go down that rabbit hole it's capitalism defined as you have to maximize return on investor on on the maximize the return for the investor that's that's the model that's used so you you capture those productivity gains and you move it up the, you move it up. And, uh, and, right. and regardless of whether you produced any value to Main Street. Regardless of whether you produce any value. And, and if you if you don't, if if part of the equation is you produce some value in terms of time and leisure, you don't that's that's of no value. It's it's all it's all reduced to economic value. Everything is reduced to economic value produced and and the 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 equation at that is any value produced goes up the ladder. That's part of this. That's part of what's going on here. There's one other thing. So we have a coffee cup. Josh has a coffee cup. Are you ready, Josh, to throw your coffee cup in? 
without breaking it? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, tying into that, and then maybe we should try to get to mapping the polarities, but the um, well, in, tying into what Paul is saying, so, well, AI is something that I can't make in my backyard, right? Or well, most people can't. So you are dependent on corporations for that. And corporations are, I don't want to say immoral, but they're definitely amoral. So then there is a that dependency on what they're providing. If all of a sudden everything becomes based on more and more things in life become based on AI, yeah, then the, the price point, I mean, right now the food price stuff, if you actually look into it, um, only a small percentage of that is inflation. They're just raising prices because they can. I mean, that's, and we're, and we're just like, oh, what are we going to do? Um, I mean, there are things we can do, but we've accepted that for food. So there's no question that that would happen for this stuff. And, and then perhaps tying into that and maybe embellishing the other, one of the other lists. So humans doing physical work, less dangerous work, humans doing work versus AI taking those jobs, I think is more the issue. So if it's in the future where it's like AI is taking the jobs and then humans are, not all the jobs, obviously, but some of them, humans are more dependent on AI. Corporations jack the prices. All of a sudden, a lot of humans are not going to have their, quote, basic needs met because our basic need will be like an AI in every home or whatever. So that's just some of my thoughts. We could probably list these forever. Maybe it's worth just picking one. and. You know, actually, uh, I from from understanding more about polarity mapping, most of the time is spent doing this work. So I'm actually very good because once you get these defined, kind of like what goes into them is sort of obvious in a lot of ways. Like you could, you know, it's an exercise, but it's not as, in I mean, to me, this is like more in juicy, but I, I actually want to throw one thing. I want to do my own coffee cup here. And that is when I was thinking about this close example, we all give up so much individual individuality when we go to whatever favorite store. It might be, you know, Gap or I, I don't even know. I love Prana, you know, it's because that's the kind of person I am, a yoga, you know, active person. But whatever. It's like you I run into people on the street that are wearing something either exactly the same, even if I bought it from a thrift store. Like I will find people in this world that are wearing the same thing. Right. So that we're giving up the individuality of every garment. My mom made it for me and is very special to have like to I didn't I spent 40, 50 dollars on this prana outfit or, you know, per per piece. And I run into people who look just like me. So I think there's something there that's also because I, I've been playing with these tools a lot since last time and thinking about it a lot. And basically we're just getting very standardized crap that's, you know, kind of boilerplate, like this is what this looks like. And we can all just say like, I guess that's what it is, or we can take a lot of time to individualize it in Photoshop or something or edit things that come out of the AI system. So that's another thing is like having standardized things that come out versus the individualization of creating things on your own. Um, so I just want to throw that out there as a coffee shop cup coffee cup and i think it goes well with but i had a very quick coffee cup to, to paul and josh there um on that yes. theme because basically karl marx identified that problem back in the first industrial revolution it's the paradox of capitalism that every capitalist basically wants to eliminate the workers to maximize productivity you know initially pay them as little as possible but if they can automate eventually eliminate the workers but then the problem is if, if no one has jobs there's no one to pay for the product uh and that's that's a paradox that karl marx mm. you know saw um, mm -hmm. in the first industrial revolution, but yeah. Okay. Well, interestingly enough, though, I, I I think that we have come up with a solution for that. And I mean, it's called guaranteed minimum income. You know, if we're willing to say, you know, and, and I'm not naive as to say, if you reduce that issue to purely economic things, that there aren't other problems. I mean, what do you, what does that human that doesn't, who's basic material needs are being met automatically, what do they do? I mean, there's that, there's a whole set of issues that come out of that. But from an economic standpoint, um, you could solve all of these issues 
if the, if we accepted um, guaranteed minimum income. The problem with that is, who, where's that income going to come from? Who, who are you going to have to tax? Well, you're going to have to tax the wealthy. You know, so so then there's a whole other set of polarities in Senate. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. I don't know. Did I capture everything that was just said? You know, humans having money via jobs and and maximizing human leisure time. Like, okay. All right. I think I lost track, but I think it's Barbara and then Bill, maybe. Um, okay. I'm, I'm going to add the one that we hit on a while back and didn't capture. And that is, you know, okay, so we've got a million people doing all this work and 7 million getting UBI, right? So uh, exactly when does Atlas shrug, right? So, so the, uh, you know, maybe the end game is that AI does it all and none of us work and none of us have any meaning, but um, I, 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 I think that, that what happens is, uh, you know, all of this virtual world is all well and good, but there are a group of humans out there that are working their butts off to keep the power on. Uh, and that's not something that I suspect an AI will do in the, in the next 20 years, uh, you know, going out and fixing the power lines when, when the snow takes them down, right? N not, not, not anything that we're ready to do in the foreseeable future. But so, you know, you say, Paul, do it, get it from the rich. But um, right now we're taking it from the, from the uh, professional middle class. We're, we're not uh, taking any of, of that guaranteed income from, from the billionaires. Um, Every penny that they tossed out in COVID ended up uh, increasing billionaires' net worth. Uh, oh, that's I don't a fact. Agree with that at all. I mean, you're absolutely right there. Yeah. So, so I think I, but I, that uh, that 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 that's what we said. But uh, what what happens when when the workers revolt? I mean, it it we we saw starvation in Russia when the farmers said, "Hell no! If 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 you're going to make us starve and take it to give to the commissar so he can eat like like a, a king, we're just not going to grow food." The hell with you folks, right? And and that's you know that was always the problem with with Marx's ideas that uh, you know some somehow we produce uh, uh, according to our ability and and get things according to our he said needs, but but you and I but all we all know it's get things according to our wants, right? Yeah. Um, and so I I I one billion humans doing the work revolt against this this. Both of when, both both sides when, could revolt. No, <laughs> nope. Uh, never, never happens. As long as you're giving them bread and circuses, it's not going to happen. It's I, I don't know. Anyways, this is all extremely fascinating. Okay, Barbara, did I capture it, or do you want me to edit this more? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. I, I understand the meaninglessness there. Uh huh. Um, Vonnegut talks a lot about that. All right, I, I would say I would say one billion doing work, one billion uh, feeling meaningless, and six billion the the feeling meaningless and revolting, and and six billion uh, uh, taking 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 and and until the the workers revolt and and it's done. Okay, I really think both sides are going to revolt. But anyways, we we can dig in on the polarity map. Okay, Bill. Thanks. Um, first, I have a coffee cup and then a more serious comment. Um, with regard to uh, grandma's sewing machine and your individuality with your clothing, Beth, um, 
I think when I watch my kids cook these days, they just get their recipes off the internet. And, you know, that's fine, right? Except that those grandma's recipes were made with love and in the handwriting, and it was made over and over again and modified and modified and little, you know, and, uh, you know, looking at my mother's recipes with her handwriting that was perfect, you know, um, just is a little different than the standardized stuff that's out there. Um, my more uh, serious comment is uh, about polarities and then an author that you may not know about. Um, I think that there are mother polarities, as Barry Johnson puts it, and um, one of them is stability and tradition uh, versus progress and change. And so, you know, the sewing machine is progress uh, with leads to more productivity uh, that is hopefully makes life easier uh, or less suffering, shall we say, and it has to be sustainable. So a sustainable, less suffering would be sort of the goal up top, um, which brings me to the thought. Uh, I listened to a podcast this week uh, by a black gentleman, Glenn Lowry, who is um, he's black and he is anti-affirmative action. Uh, and he is a professor at Brown. And he had a colleague of his on, a fellow economist, I think his name was Odin, O-D-E-N, or something similar to that. And he has studied um, the economics of progress over the years. And so when we talk about progress, right, new goods and services that make our lives better and easier, the question is who gets them, okay? And usually after something is invented, people don't really know how valuable it is, but then after a while it starts becoming mass marketed and it helps a lot of people, but it doesn't help everyone. And interestingly, the result of that is an increase in population. And so although there are more goods and services, there are more people. So the standard of living really doesn't go up. You still have the haves and the have nots. And only recently have some industrialized countries decreased their birth rates. So now some of those countries are actually able to provide enough goods and services to most people so that the standard of living really is going up for everyone, some more than others, but, but it, it, I, I thought that was an interesting comment that, you know, if, if the result of increase in productivity is simply increase in population, which is increased demand for resources and things, then you're always going to have the haves and the have nots. Neil, can I add a quick coffee cup to that? Which I, I think the, the difference between the haves and the have-nots is, is relative, right? It's in relative wealth, so to do with the distribution of wealth. Um, whereas in terms of absolute terms, I think people now, most, you know, most probably say in the, in the, in the West, at least, maybe not true globally, but um, people generally, the average standard of life now is kind of equivalent to almost like a king in medieval times. <laughs> if you think about the amount of eat, you know, quality of food and entertainment people can enjoy, pretty much everyone can enjoy now. Um, versus your turnip soup. Um, <laughs> if you're a peasant in, in medieval times in the UK, at least, you know, so in terms of, of material life, most people in the West have, have, have had a huge increase in standard of life, a, a sort of, you know, quality of uh, standard of living. Um, but, but the disparity between the haves and the have-nots is still there. So, but that's in, the, in relative world terms, right? And that, but psychologically, that's still very, very meaningful to people because people don't want to feel like they're at the bottom of the, of the, of the ladder. Great. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Steve. Okay, so Josh, 
Who's next? Sure, and I'd be happy to give my spot to somebody who hasn't spoken yet first. So if Daryl or Marjorie or David or even Veronica. No, I, I'll just keep listening because I came in late and I want to get the gist of the conversation. I, I'm tracking, but I, I need to listen a little bit more. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Well, so one other thing to maybe add to the list of polarities is increasing dependence on advanced technology versus, I guess, current dependence on it. So in terms of art, I'm noticing, so there's a, a lot of the to do about AI art, but now there's actually AI stories and writing and a lot of the story publishers are getting flooded with a bunch of AI entries, which I actually find funny because they say they, they're having trouble telling them apart and it's, that's because those editors have no real ability to uh, discern. So that's their own fault. But, you know, do we want a, a world in which, you know, so, my writing, I am dependent these days on a word processor, right? I, I do write my first draft by hand, then I put it on a thing, and then I kind of do an editing process, which you couldn't do by hand. You have to cross out and rewrite. So I am, I acknowledge I'm somewhat dependent on technology for my writing. I resist becoming increasingly dependent on it because it changes the art form. Or for another example is like, so, so I play, instruments and Bet's husband plays uh, bluegrass music, guitar. Uh, my cousin has no, has developed no musical skill whatsoever, but he, he calls himself a DJ and that's all cool. And it's like, well, some people like DJs. Okay. But let's acknowledge that we're, we're increasingly dependent on plugging in a thing, sampling other people's music versus Bet's husband who can literally just pick up a guitar and, and, all right, I'm going to do a G chord, whatever. It's still technology, but we have this increasing level of technological dependence that I'm just using the arts example that I do think can erase our ability to create art in some ways. He plays the violin, by the way. Like, right, nice. Yeah. You know you know, the thing, this is, this is exactly, I think, the same thing that I was trying to say with efficiency versus individuality. When, when a author used to write a, a book by hand and then hand out one copy to their friend, and that was the only book there was because we didn't have the printing press. I mean, think about how individual, each letter was carefully created and with love and so much passion. And then that one friend could read that book if that person was literate. And that's where it ended. Now, when you put your words in a word processor, it's all, all the T's are going to look the same. Each one is not developed with love, by the way, I'm kind of like playing devil's advocate here. So I think every time we use a technology, it takes away the individuality. You know, every T is not made with love anymore, but you're able to now distribute it to anyone in the planet who knows how to read English, or you can even probably run through a translator and edit it a little bit and then have it in other languages so it's i almost feel like it's like you know efficiency and distribution and absolute creating one of a, i guess is where what is it called e ent's eft's whatever they were that yeah. thankfully those went away but creating like a one-off specific art piece and scaling Right, right, something like that. But I just want to make sure the other component isn't lost. That's definitely true. But, you know, there's a level of technology that may be appropriate versus, I guess it's getting into that unfettered. No, we're just doing a new thing because we can do it. But here's the thing. When the power goes out, let's just say temporarily, or let's just say maybe more often, or let's just say for good, right? But most of the technophiles will never acknowledge the fact that we live on a finite planet with finite resources. Um, your husband can still play music. My cousin's just sitting there in the dark, pushing on his computer and nothing's coming out. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I think the assumption is that, well, be, you know, because we'll always have infinite energy and technology, I don't know if that's true. So I think that dependence, I think there's a reason why in our genetics, we have some technophobes who are, who are preserving that sort of basic thing. I mean, you can play an acoustic guitar to a crowd without anything else. Um, if you're just an electric guitar player and 
your chord doesn't work, you your your guitar doesn't make a sound really. Yeah. I okay. All right, cool. Okay, I want to do like one more and, and so Barbara and then Paul and then let's take like a 5 minute break and then let's let's pick which one of these I, we want to I want to do a a uh a, a little bit of a change on that. Uh Okay. Depend uh self-sufficiency at the survival level uh i i will guarantee that that uh if uh instead of taking down a couple of business towers that um the uh terrorists had taken out the uh northeast power grid which is easy to do uh in uh below uh freezing weather that we would have had hundreds of thousands dead they would have frozen to death in the dark with no food and water. Uh, so, and, you know, most people um, couldn't feed themselves for a week if uh, grocery stores weren't open. So, so it's, it's not about art and, uh, you know, being able to entertain yourself. It's about, um, being able to feed yourself without all this high tech crap and we've gone beyond the uh breaking point on that uh, a long long ways and and we saw it in um uh, covid where um farmers here were dumping milk because uh the milk processing plants uh on, only were able to put it in pints for school kids now you know, and and part of that is just human stupidity, right? I mean, if I if I'd have filled those pints, driven them over to the to the local Safeway, uh, they would have sold. Moms would have bought them in, instead of the uh, gallons that weren't available. What the heck, right? But so we both have lack of human problem solving and and lack of the capacity to uh, even feed ourselves without all this. Uh, global infrastructure uh you know and and that may be one of the biggest issues that nobody likes to look at right it's very scary okay yeah, that's why nobody wants to look at it right yeah paul thank you barbara and, and i don't i don't want to i don't want to change what we're going to go to next because i think this has been good but i mean we just identified Seven, I counted them. I think I counted 17 different lists of polarities of AI. We could probably go on and, and you know, do three, five or six pages of it. Um, it, it. This is feeling, this is feeling very, very first tier. This is feeling very reductionistic to me. I mean, this, we're not integrating a, a fucking thing here. We're just identifying 17 different pieces of a bigger problem. Um, is there a way that we could, not today, I think, and maybe what I'm proposing is we let's keep going with this process. But at some point, we got to move beyond <clears throat> the polarity aspect of it because, you know, there's nothing integral about polarity management. What's, what's integral is you've got 50 different polarities all interacting and how do you how do you deal with that and I don't have an answer I'm just saying maybe that's something we can explore on an ongoing basis yeah okay I'm proposing let's all take a five minute human break because we're all humans and then let's come back and we can decide if we want to pick one of these and maybe we can pick it and and say like what second tier look at, at you know what instead of you know humans doing work versus you know or and this let's what's second tier so let's all take five um so look at your clock everyone's going to be in a different time zone and and we will be right back you know what's the best technology ever invented by hum humanity the automatic coffee making machine. People who love to do pour overs or I don't know, all the different ways you can hand craft coffee. 
No, silly. My automatic, you know, I don't even know what kind of coffee machine it is, but it is so good. I just grind the coffee in my grinder. It's an automatic grinder. And then I pour the water in it boils the water for me. It puts, it has a rain head thing, washes over the coffee. I mean, this is the best. So tell me, Ben, how, 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 how would your, I'm, I'm going to be a little contrarian here. Um, I guess I would say that based on that, then maybe which is more important, the coffee grinder or the coffee maker? Hmm. You know what? I don't, I've never done the hand grinding thing, the burr grinder, the hand, but I did have one of the ones where you had to push it down, the blades. I've really gotten into coffee the last few years. Anyways. Oh, yeah. So I did, think you, did you ever come up with your resolution for how to keep the perfect fr French press coffee hot enough? To where it's perfect for you. Did you did you go over the? I got, side? I got a insulated French pet press. But what I discovered is that French press has so much grit in it, and yeah. I would end up using maybe two fil paper filters trying to get the grit out of it. And at the end, it was still getting cold because I had to do so much work. Anyways, my you coffee didn't... journey has been long. You didn't go over the dark side and and throw it in the microwave then. I do not have a microwave. I refuse. I refuse. I have standards. Come on, Paul. All right. So are we all back? I made coffee, fed the, my outdoor cat. Uh, you know, I went outside and looked at the sunshine. I hope everyone had a really nice break. Think some new thoughts. Okay, so Barbara has her hand up. And uh, so do you have an idea on how we can go to second tier here, Barbara? Uh, yeah. Um so uh, the, uh, the, the yellow response to this, Bill, Bill mentioned it and, and had to drop off. Um, so I'll, I'll try and channel for him. Um, it's, it's this idea of meta polarities. Uh, so I, I just went through uh, during our break and, and looked at these. So the idea is that these are all small manifestations of bigger ideas, right, of, of bigger issues. So, for example, we, we uh, the, a bunch of these would come under the uh, era of, of physical ease and individual meaning, right? Life, life gets physically easier and, and our mental health goes to hell in a handbasket. Um, we, we talk about the trade-off between doing it because we can and taking reasonable precautions. So, so a lot of these, e even the last one that I put in of what happens when this stuff goes down and, and you can't even uh, make dinner, right? Oh, I'll, I'll, pour, I'll put them in the uh, thing for you. Um, so uh, a, another, one is resource limitations and people's wants, right? This is not about needs. This is not about we all have the right to health care. This is about people want, 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 uh, without any thought as, as to the value of what they want. And 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 that you know can maybe tie back to the meaning, right? But but that's um, that's and then there's the one about who gets the value. And I started to say uh, the value to the actual producers. Um, and and value in other ways because there's two other directions, right? So the socialist direction says. The value, the actual producer should just give uh, all, all their hard work to whoever wants it, right? And then the capitalists say um, that the value should go to whoever can uh, work the financial system more efficiently. And uh, if you haven't read Saeed's work on only money matters, we no longer have a capitalist system. 
we, we have a financial system. Uh, in, in a capitalist system, you could not uh, make money off of vaporware. You, you, you just couldn't because there's no, there's no physical value there, right? So, so, so now uh, if you need to make money off of vaporware, the Fed just prints it for you. So, so we're not working in the real world and we're not, so I, I'm not sure how to look at that fourth one. Um, and, 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 and maybe it's an, and all other value distributions, right? Be, because people that can't produce want, want the value distributed other ways. At the, uh, you know, I, I, like I say, I had trouble figuring out that last one. This is great, Barbara. Thanks for bringing your INTJ brain in. And uh... <laughs> this, this, this is actually what we try to do uh, with OD, and most OD people can't get beyond uh, green and saying, "Well, what do we care about?" <laughs> yeah, um, but so. So we, we can group, I don't think they're, um, it, it, we can pull, pull them under metapolarities and see if I've missed one. Uh, okay. But um, I, I think we've, we've got the basic ideas here at, at a macro level, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, then, okay. then, and, and so this really helps because the problem is at first tier. This is not a second tier problem. Uh, you know, a second tier wouldn't uh, be running a system like this in the first place. So, so it's a first tier problem and we can use the polarities to define the first tier problem in some detail, right? Because it's, it's not uh, a simple problem, right? It's a complex meta problem. And, and then we can go up uh, a level or two and, and look at, uh, ba basic factors that, that are pushing this. Oh, number four okay. should be uh, va value, to, uh, value to the actual producer and value to someone else. The consumer. No, no, no. It can be the it can be the uh, the robber baron. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah see, yeah. see. So there, there's the capitalist version of it and the socialist version, right? Um, and and neither of which uh, is is going to solve this problem of uh, what happens when Atlas shrugs, right? What happens when uh, producers are no longer willing to to work fifty hour weeks uh, for the couch potatoes to consume what what they well, make? I, right? also, I don't know if I'm, I'm not quite sure with exact meaning of polarity of meta polarities, but. I mean, there's a whole issue of who defines value and how do you get how do you get the process of defining value out of out of the very first tier. Ah, and so that's a part of four, right? That, that no, 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 that's part of four. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's it's and and we didn't put this about um, uh, money versus fiat currency, for example. Uh, that's part of four. So we could add an 18 there. Um, hard, hard money. I, I don't know if, if most of you know, but the uh, Chinese and the uh, Saudis are now going to, and the Russians are going to trade oil in um, uh, gold and other uh, commodity-backed money of their own. Hmm. So it's real money and fiat currency. Um, hmm, wow. and, and the idea being to just take down the U.S. dollar as be, because it's because our inflation is destroying the world, right? So, so that one, again, what? Yeah, the the question of what is value uh, goes under four, right? Well, yeah, but hmm. then also the whole issue of you know, I'm, I'm I'm sounding like I'm being very contrarian here, but. Um, Tell me the difference between real money and fiat money. Ah, I mean, so money, real money is is something that you can actually physically do something with in the real world. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I 
Uh, but, the, the problem but, with 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 the concept of of fiat money is that the rich simply print it and take it for themselves, and and there's no universe in which that doesn't happen. It 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 it's just a, a fact of life because we've now given uh, the robber barons a printing press, and and one of the reasons that J.P. Morgan didn't uh, wasn't able to do the same thing that they're doing now is because we still had uh, gold backing currencies. Yeah, but now you're now you're back in the argument. You're going back to. No, no, no. I'm just saying that. Um, I'm, I'm saying that the the ability for the wealthy to control the government that then controls the printing presses that then turns out and money anytime they want it is is part of this issue, right? Yeah, but okay, part, part so, of what issue? And you'd what, like, what so so you'd like to make Value. a fifth one? You'd like to make a fifth one of. How, how do we define value and and what units should we put it in right that sort of thing well, and how do you, how do you how do you maybe and I don't the word define isn't even right there how do you create I mean I'm going back to the origin of you know why was money created in the first place well money was created because it was easier than trading uh tons of grain right and and so what once you get to that um and and this is what what's it what's it my you know, asking the question, the difference between real money and fiat fiat money. Um, what what is real money? You know, the fact that we we have fiat money, kind of says that well, there is really no such thing as real money any longer, because uh, yeah, the people who are are no no longer able to eat because of inflation would agree with you. All right, guys, we need 18 more years, 18 more years. So I want to hear from someone who hasn't said anything yet, and that's Daryl. First of all, do you even know what we're doing? Do you have any questions? Because Well, from what I could gather in listening the last 30 minutes, uh, the you're talking about polarities, but uh, I guess it's the dichotomy between the polarities are defined by if AI did something, vice if we just continue doing something differently. Is that do I well, have to just discover? yeah the pros and cons of AI at a macro level and okay. and at first we had a couple of polarities and and then we went back to I I don't know do you know Barry he he, he yes you probably met him at it's one mm -hmm. of Don's things uh mm -hmm. you know he talks about the, no it's it's not a single polarity you know be real right right so right. so we started looking at some of the details of what the trade offs were okay well. So my hit, uh, you know, I, I I take my, and and I go way back. I mean, I was programming, doing projects with AI back in the early days. So I have a different affiliation, I guess, with the technology itself, because I used it to, to improve many different things. But what I was fascinated about, and the reason I even got involved with organizational change and had the opportunity to meet Don and, and folks uh, was because Despite the fact we implemented a really powerful system to help people who had to do supply support analysis for supply chain management and for outfitting ships who would be at sea for six months and making sure their repair parts were properly uh, allocated so that the probability of this thing or vice that thing failing, they had uh, a, a means by which to keep the, the ship afloat and able to fight. So, so my introduction to AI was very practical in that sense, but what was fascinating was people refuse to use the systems we design. And we, <laughs> it, it blew our mind. You know, we, we, we had, a, I won national level awards and all this for technology. And, oh, we were so happy and proud, but the, the Navy people, you just couldn't convince them that we were not going to replace them. We were trying to augment uh, their work so that they wouldn't have to do the mundane bullshit things and they could focus on more challenging problems, but they know half the, half the group bought that the other half didn't. So I marveled at the fact that people refuse to use something that seemed so obvious to me, it would help them, but they were felt they felt threatened by it. So that's my introduction to it. But I tell you, I have a, a book that I believe is like the Bible uh, in terms of what is it that AI could do for humanity uh, in the next 30, 40 years, let's say. I mean, the end of the book kind of takes you into space. So the last two chapters, I really I really didn't digest, but the first part of the book 
It was really good. It's called Life 3.0 by Max Tegmark. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Max, Max Tegmark, T-E-G-M-A-R-K. And it's called Life 3.0. And in there, the very opening of the book, there's a, um, there's a, uh, a scenario that's painted. In this book, the guy predicts within five years, and this book came out three, four years ago, something like that. And in the book, he predicts within five years, so it's right about now and the next year or so, that there will be the first AI, uh, 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 artificial intelligence will be part of a, a, a board, a, a corporate board, helping to make decisions and so on and so forth. And, you know, with the, uh, with the, with the, uh, what is happening with chat GP, I think it's chat GPI. I use it right now. And a couple of my friends have now bought the next level of usage with it. But in the book, uh, 3.0, he paints a scenario and it's a group called the Omegas, I think. Is it the Omega? It's, anyway, I mean, uh, it might be the Omegas, I might have it off. But anyway, it's a group whose uh, efforts culminated in a very powerful general artificial intelligence uh, application, which is a much bigger, broader, you know, you, you, have the, you have the machine learning kinds of things like the folks who beat the chess masters and all that with Deep Blue and all that. That's a very kind of narrow AI, but the, but the the next evolution of AI is general AI, so that they could take anything and assimilate it into knowledge and then apply that knowledge. In the book, the prediction and the scenario goes that the AI, which eventually they tried to contain, right, but it eventually con it eventually of its own found its way on the internet, and then it could siphon off large amounts of data. So the long and short of it is that a scenario is painted where they established a media company, eventually took over the stock market, eventually took over all centers of powers in the world, okay? And uh, won an Academy Award because the arts people have no idea that, you know, as we are talking today, uh, AI could actually write a full story. And the next step would be, and some people are doing this right now, AI can actually render GPI, and basically have their own actors. And so in this book, uh, the scenario, when the Omegas decided to, okay, well, we've cornered the stock market, we make more money per hour than anybody else. And, then they cornered the, the, the arts and media market by winning the, an Academy Award, so on and so forth. And then it took to addressing the actual social ills in the world. And it, what I remember is it, it had seven areas in which it began to design a new world from, their, from the AI's perspective. Now, mind you, there's a conversation going on right now about who's programming these AIs, okay? And at some point, the AI took over programming itself in this scenario, but it looked at seven areas of power. And, and change policies, change implementations, change money flows and everything else to what end? To the end to bring about a more peaceful world. Now that's the intent. Now, once you're going down the road, it kind of leaves you with the scenario and say, well, what will happen in the future? Will it continue on down this path of creating a more just uh, and uh, productive world with less, uh, less violence and so on and so forth? So the, the, I'll tell you the seven areas he talked about was um, first was the uh, was getting rid of uh, basically basically tax reductions, okay, uh, 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 government social programs reduction, military spending around the world reduction, and uh, basically engendering more free trade, more open borders, and uh, more socially responsible companies, transferring the responsibility to take care of citizens from governments because you reduce all of that. Uh, to put in the onus on having responsible companies, so to speak, companies with a soul. But basically, the way the AI did this, it had this array of companies around the world that no one really realized, who is this that's doing all these things that seems to be just cornering the market in this and cornering the market in that and then dictating how one ought to be with this. And because the AI was so interconnected with itself, none, no company, no industry sector could figure out what is happening to us. It is a fascinating scenario it paints. And so you come down with two camps, you know, there was a public, uh, there was a something put out a few years ago with a lot of scientists. And I think Elon Musk and a couple other high tech folks were in the camp and saying, you know, we, we really need to contain AI. Um, uh, and then, uh, I mean, almost everybody signed on to this. And I'm, I'm in the camp where you have to develop, it's like, it's like money. You know, but people say, well, money is the root of all evil. That's not actually what the Bible says. The Bible actually says it's the love of money that is the root of all evil, not money itself. Money really has no 
intention of, of its own, right? And so what I, I like the idea of making sure your protocols are developed so that you, you know, you allow for the exploration of the technology because AI can influence in a positive way so many things. So I'm in the camp of give me more AI uh, and free up humanity so that humanity can Humanity, the life cycle we're on right now, we're on a, we're not on a, a life cycle where we live, you know, we, we, we grow up, we live, we do something and we die. The u- human life cycle is different than the life cycle of money. And what we are in the main, what we're in the game of right now, we are basing our life and livelihood and efforts and interest on the availability of money, so to speak. And so our trajectory is functioning basically on the cycle of money, the money cycle, which we all know is created out of thin air by people who have, they can do whatever they want, like Barbara was saying. But if if that could be taken care of and the economy and everything else is running smoothly, now I can actually determine what exactly I want to do if I did not have to make sure eight hours a day I had to go into work to keep my lights turned on, keep my children fed, that kind of thing. So I'm I'm in the camp that is positive on the aspects of what AI can do for society, but you have to intentionally design all the things out of the system that ought to not influence it, and that might be hard to do. But at some point, it's just like uh, I'll say this last thing: computers right now, people don't build computers whereas they used to build computers. Robots build computers now. A, 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 a computer like an Apple iPad. Basically, a human being won't touch it until they pick it up to put it in a package, and they may not be doing that. You know, that too is probably automated. And so it's getting to the point where the AI uh, is going to basically, uh, in my way of looking at it, enhance the well being of humanity. That's the way I look at it. And I realize I'm a sick optimist. But- well, now, to me, the whole issue again boils back down to, you know, what's, what is, what is spiral dynamics? It's a bunch of V means, value means. It, this is all a values issue. I mean, it, it, at some level, it doesn't have anything to do with AI. I mean, we already live in a world that's dominated that by human corporations. You know, and mm-hmm. human corporations r- operate under a set of rules mm-hmm. that are made by other human corporations and other human organizations. And so we're already in a quasi AI dominated world. You know, you can't, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, well, the way I look at it, Paul, technology is ubiquitous all around us, you know. Um, and so how we harness that, you know, is key, I, I think, you know. But no, right. no. Yeah, I'm, not trying- I'm going to jump back in. I'm going to jump back in. I really want to hear some from, from Sphere, Sophie. Did, Sophia, by the way, we only have 20 minutes left and we have to solve this today. <laughs> We've been mandated, mandated. Just kidding. All right. So, Daryl, thanks for joining. And by the way, we are sticking with AI that's available today. ChatGPT is available today. I love this book that you recommended. I'm going to add it to my wish list. But I, I just want to make sure you know, like, that was one of the rules that we set out in the beginning that uh, you missed. But it, it's like, what is the AI of today? And that's the one that we're talking about. But anyways, very interesting uh, I, stuff. You know, I don't know. Okay, all right, that's fine. I, that, I don't know what that means. Well, that's another, yeah, it's another good question. But anything, anything that's available today to use, we're just talking about that versus some sci-fi, a no, no, no. Well, artificial well, let me, general. Well, well, no, let me just... no, for you to use or, or for uh, some corporate uh, villain to use? Well, well, I guess what I'm saying is this, that the, the technology for AI to write a story exists today. The technology, I just met a guy from Wyoming, the technology for AI to render images on its own exists today, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so to your point, every this guy's book, while maybe nobody, no AI sits on the board right now, uh, but but art is already being impacted by AI. They may not know it though. And and the technology for AI that, uh, that uh, manipulates markets is already out there. Already here. Identified it's, with its results, uh, not yet identified who's, who's, who all is running it. 
right. fintech the technology of, of AI to bring down, uh, uh, say, the power grid is already out there. It's true. It is. Those are all here yeah. today already. Those are all the ones. But what what is not there is some human level consciousness AI that is making its own decisions and deciding whatever it wants to do. But anyways, I really appreciate new voices in the discussion. So I want to hear from Sisphere and then from Sophia and then um, then if we have time for Josh, you can come back in. Sorry, Josh. Oh, thank you. Uh, you probably, I don't know if you spoke about it before I uh, joined, but from spiral dynamic, when I'm looking at it, at AI is uh, the VMIM, VMIM that create AI and the main VMIM that use AI is orange. Not entirely, but it's mainly orange. And from spiral dynamic experience, we know the damage that orange do. Uh, the same way he did with capitalism, and the same way he did with uh, uh, pollution the planet. Uh, we, we have to be naive not to think that it will make the same damages as orange always did. But it also, we have to look at the, at the bright side that it will give uh, some progress the way orange always do. And I'm, co I'm quite, uh, actually I'm quite, uh, I wouldn't say surprised, but I, I'm quite happy because there's a lot of criticism around the world that coming from green and from blue about it. It's from the first day AI uh, uh, started to be popular and went to be an open source for everybody. I read a lot of articles about how people are gonna lose their jobs which is kind of blue thinking and a lot of, uh, of uh, um, comment from green uh, about how it's, uh, it's uh, gonna um, uh, reduce uh, the human contact, the community. So we, we have some kind of balance when looking about it between orange and green, green, blue, but unfortunately, I'm pretty sure that it will make the damages that orange always do. And I don't have an answer, answer but if AI was developed and used completely with a, from yellow values, how would we de develop it differently? How will we use it differently? And I don't really have an answer. Uh, if somebody can help me, I would appreciate. Unbelievable. I was waiting for the answer and uh, I guess we're not getting it today. Okay, let's, uh, so Sophia, do you wanna join? Do you wanna say anything? Good to see you. Good to be here. It's a bit noisy here. I'm in the Hampstead Theater. They're just going back in. Um, the only thing really I'm thinking about, because I missed the first half, I, the usual time lapse, um, is this business that people who, have, as Barbara said, people who are programming the biases, the people who program AI itself, are mostly left brain people. And even if we can get the whole picture, it still fragments of something rather than a right brain perspective, so I don't really know how to articulate that, so thanks. All right, thanks, Sophia. Thanks for joining live from the theater there, giving us a report. Thanks. Okay, uh, I want to do a coffee cup on that. So if we think about the sewing machine, which we start off, I, I started off with this thinking I've been doing about the sewing machine and how we trade it off individuality from our mom making all our clothes to us using the sewing machine to us putting the sewing machine in a factory in some country that we don't see and we just get all these blueprint you know stamped out clothes i mean the sewing machine is very left brain it's like a hundred percent left brain right i mean it's just like that's what it does is it, it, it's like a very tool 
And then the human can put the ensemble together and dress and like put a nice necklace. And anyways, uh, I think it's just an interesting thing to remember that the tool itself is always going to just be a tool. If the human can come in with the right brain and use the tool for a purpose, then that could help balance it out. Yes, Barbara says in the chat, all things are, all, all tools are left brain. So maybe we shouldn't expect so much from these poor tools. Anyways, Sophia, good good bringing the book both sides of the brain in okay so let's go to jo oh, marjorie put her hand up all right marjorie good i want to hear new voices hi i've been listening the whole time um yeah i really just don't have enough experience in my world that i know of that, that artificial intelligence is even really in my world that much and maybe it's there and I don't, i'm not aware of it but um and I, i'm still at the stage of trying to define exactly what is ai in my world you know what does it mean to me uh, but it, but on the other hand when we're talking just the recent discussion here about uh so much uh first tier and especially orange influence um uh, with ai why do we suppose that is why is green and and second tier not more um prolific or more more um why why do we not see more influence coming from that that side of uh, of life? Uh, why why do we suppose that is? Very fascinating, and and maybe that's I don't know where everyone is. I would hope like all a little bit more high level. I don't know. Anyways, it'd be nice if if we could think of ways to leverage these tools for for the good things that we're doing. Right. If we're doing something good, how can we use the tools to amplify and influence the tool? So, Marjorie, thank you You're for bringing that in. Yeah. All right, Josh, we only have 10 minutes left to, to like solve it all. Right. Well, one of the pieces in regards to spiral dynamics, we're talking second tier and all that stuff. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. If, I think everything can be second tier and also looking at first tier can be second tier or nothing is who cares but one of the things to do with the health of the spiral right and this is something i've been looking at more and more in terms of all right i'm doing environmental stuff i'm going to do some yellow integral version of that oh everyone hates it everyone's against me now okay well that's not going to work obviously so what i'm doing is i'm chameleoning or just embracing or just acknowledging my own green components and going back into green, trying to strip out some of the toxic elements there, but, but just playing in the green sandbox. So in terms of, and I'll, I'll give a different example, then I'll tie it back into AI thing that I think might be a worthwhile endeavor and ties into kind of what Daryl was saying, what Safria was saying, even what Marjorie was saying is, all right, so nuclear power, right? Um, there are, so orange, I would say primarily has been pushing nuclear power for a long time. They're saying, well, technologically speaking on paper and using computers, it is clean and it can solve a lot of problems. Um, you know, I, I think there's pieces left out in terms of infinite energy and infinite growth, but leaving those aside, there are many, many downsides as in the hundreds and hundreds of recorded accidents and you know and then the many more that are unrecorded just this week 400,000 gallons of tritium laced uh water in the Minneapolis area um, which is not uncommon um and so what i've seen other um professedly integral operations doing with environmental stuff and i'm going to bring it back to ai I just like to have a different uh module to maybe better understand so what they're doing is saying listen i know there's a lot of the really really bad nuclear stuff but there's this small scale nuclear that doesn't actually exist yet whatever that we can do and that's all good and cool and that's we're advocating for that because we're post green and we're integral and we're not going to be so green as to just oppose nuclear is what these integral folks are saying but what i'm pointing out is right now nuclear power largely because of you know the focus on climate and not looking at all the other issues of toxicity um you know overconsumption whatever biodiversity so nuclear power is pushing full speed ahead and there's no real competent green opposition 
to it. So what ultimately the quote integral voices in this are doing, it, they're just replicating orange because to say, well, we want this better version of it. We all know it's gonna be the shitty version and then a tiny bit of the better version too. So what my point is, is in terms of AI is I think an integral approach to how do we make sure the best version of it comes out is to help organize and promote a green that actually has its shit together to fight back against AI, not because it's going to prevent it, not because that black and white view of AI is bad and everything else is good is accurate, but because we need some measures of resistance to make sure it's kind of acting as a filter to go through. Because my belief in advocacy is you need an advocacy group to be like, hell no, hell no. It's they're, If they were the dictators of the world just saying, hell no, that would be a problem, but they're not. They're just an advocacy force. So things are right over here. This advocacy force pushes it at least to here. So what I'm, what I'm saying is when I see people who are shitting on AI, I support them because not because I think that they're going to win or even because I think that their perspective is accurate, that we're going to get rid of all AI or AI is bad, but because I know that side needs a bit more bolstering if we're going to come out um, in a world in which it is not fully destructive. So that's just my take on it. And I, I think that looking at, okay, dabbling in the different tier elements to make sure it's healthy is a more uh, realistic perspective than just, you know, I think integral really needs to be careful of like, is your perspective matching 100% with orange? If so, maybe it's not as integral. I'm not accusing anyone here of doing that though. But. I would suspect you've hit the nail on the head. A, a, a quick follow up on, on that. Um, so somebody recently who's, who's working in the political realm, when, when he was seeing all the stuff, uh, in, including Suzanne Crook, Greitner's uh, comment that uh, sh she had done her um, stage analysis on on it without knowing it was uh, AI generated, and th thought that it was uh, about on the what we would call the blue orange boundary with really weird um, wings uh, up and down, and uh, and more verbose than than the normal human would be, uh, and thinking about that. This guy then said, well, you know, if that's where it is, that it's been programmed by kind of the powers that be, right? That That's what power looks like in the real world. Why don't we ask chat a, why don't we ask uh, chat APT how, um, how we would uh, prevent, say, a, uh, uh, a, a runoff between Biden and Trump again as our next US election? Could we ask, in other words, if if this if this has been programmed by the folks that that are kind of pulling the strings behind some of these problems, why don't we ask it uh, how we could uh, go about preventing some of of the downside? Uh, don't know that he's been able to come up with the right way to question it, right? But an interesting thought. Maybe, maybe we also should uh, look about using it to. Oh, um, it, it, yeah. Well, one thing you know, one thing you know, every time, every time you, um, uh, every time you are on the phone and you go through these series of questions without talking to a human being, we are training the fuzzy logic system and and uh, the auto the uh, artificial neural network. So that that introduces AI learning on its own. You can start with the programmers who might be young hipsters in Silicon Valley. But if the minute they are applying artificial neural networks, that basically says the AI, uh-huh, I got it now. Just like a first grader will eventually learn how to write in cursive and everything like that on their own. So, so there is, I mean, for sure, there is the inherent bias that will go in there. But I think with some of the fuzzy logic, some of the artificial neural network methodology they have, uh, eventually that could that noise could be smoothed out. Sure, because I've already been impacted by some of the uh, the cognitive bias is designed in, but AI, so, so if we asked it how to prevent the, the bias, has five I mean, areas: just visual recognition, doing... speak. Uh, what, what, are you saying it would it would learn that our our doubts if we asked it questions along those lines? 
Yeah, can I just have a, a copy cup here? I mean, basically with these AI systems, the, the bias is coming through the data set they train them on. That's where it comes in. It's not so much through the alg algorithmic design. You can build in kind of guardrail stuff, but really it's it's the bias inherent in the data set you train it on. So that's where the ethics around the bias really lie in terms of making, you know, you ha how do you pick and the that's data? A problem. Yeah, that's, yeah. A real, that's a real challenge. And that's where the work really lies. I, okay, I we're, we're almost done here. Let's have to Sphere help us. Yeah, I'm just, it's exact, what I want to talk exactly, it's exactly what Barbara was talking about. I kind of checked uh, ChatGBT about it, like to, to ask questions, is God exist or sh what should they vote? And I got to say this right now, as the algorithm is very careful and is much better than if you search in social network or in Google, because it's give, a few perspective for some uh, uh, questions that doesn't have uh, that doesn't have uh, a straight fact, a scientific scientific fact. So in that way, if you search Google what to vote and uh, somebody paid for uh, I don't know uh, some kind of companies that all the algorithm of Google will say, say vote Trump. So. Right now, the algorithm of, uh, of ChatGPT is better because it gives a, a more careful perspective and it gives you some answer, some answer. Like some people believe that the best way is to vote for this or the best thing is to vote for this because this of this. So in, in a, some way it's a positive and maybe it's one step toward flexible second year thinking. <laughs> But Sophia, that's if you're talking about statistics. Underlying that is the language itself. If you if you put G, uh, in chat GBT somatics, then it comes out with the Oxford, Oxford Dictionary definition, which is the body as opposed to the mind, which completely denies the whole concept of somatic is that you are a whole human being. And as a whole human being, you're having a relationship an experiential relationship with your whole Have you checked so it? it? Have you checked yes. it? Because I, I yes. think, I yes. think some, it gives there are some beliefs. Put somatics in. Put somatics into G, chat, chat GPT and see what it says. Okay, I will check it. It's a language okay. thing. I, I feel like we ran out of time and, and we didn't solve it all, but I think there's some interesting things that I can kind of glean is we humans who interact with it are training it. We are training it. It's emerging. And so if each of us works hard to develop our own person and be evolved and think new thoughts and think, you know, second tier levels, maybe we can make this thing work and evolve and grow and learn and it can learn that mind body is the same thing sophia so i think we all just need to get out there and do some yoga and uh go to second tier and really live second tier and then work in our companies and make second tier things and so that the the system will learn like oh wow there's another way we can think bigger picture anyways I'm, I'm see how I found a way to end it on a positive note there. <laughs> We're all going to ask the precautionary questions and, and take it beyond its initial uh, biases. Yes. Well, I'm with that. I'm going to go do my Tai Chi clear. Good. All right. Well, thank you all so much. It's been such a fun time. And I, you guys are all awesome and have a wonderful week. See you guys next week. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Beth. Thanks, everybody. Thank Great you. Great conversation. Bye.